Hare Krishna, Mohan Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. Thank you very much for joining the Monk's podcast. I thought today we would discuss on, you know, say, right brain and left brain approaches to understanding scriptural knowledge. I've seen your presentation and I've heard your talks on this topic. I felt this very intriguing. And the context from which uh, we'll discuss this, I thought we could discuss is that there are certain aspects of the Bhagavatam which are difficult for the modern ra rational mind to accept. So how this approach could help it more become more acceptable? Yeah. So, <clears throat> firstly, Maharaj, is there any uh, uh, the idea of right brain and ref left brain? Uh, this is is this more like a modern uh, modern neuroscience construct, and it is also more like. Uh, even it's sometimes considered a little obsolete because uh, the brain is not literally polarized like that. People yeah. can have a lobotomy where they don't have a significant part of one brain and still yeah. they can function. So it's more like there's a logical brain and there is a more of an intuitive brain. We have our brain has a logical side and intuitive side and it may not necessarily equate with left and right, but that usage has yeah. become more conventional now. Isn't yeah. It? yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this was, of course, uh, once a presentation that uh, one uh, doctor has given, uh, and some people also to some degree agree with it. Um, we do have two parts of our brain, obviously. And uh, she had a stroke, and her uh, one part of her brain, her logical brain, went off. Oh. And then she just had the right brain. So she was perceiving the world in a completely different way. <laughs> from a intuitive point of view and she was like merging in Brahman and things like this. And then, but then periodically she would shift back to her regular brain. So she was able to make a phone call. That was a big struggle to call the ambulance. Uh, but she would go back and forth between these two brains. And then she understood that uh, uh, because of the stroke, uh, she got some sort of realization of uh, different levels of consciousness. Yeah. And it was related to the two parts of the brain. Of course, we cannot say it's an absolute division, whatever. But uh, it, it's very useful to consider the brain also is involved in consciousness to some degree. Even though in the Vedic literature, we don't have mention of the brain at all. <laughs> we can use that model to some degree to help yes, common please. people uh, accept uh, higher levels of consciousness. At least that, that much we can do with this uh, Analogy. Is this the same lady who gave the TED talk on my stroke of insight? She yeah, had a, well, yeah, I think so, probably. Yeah, yeah it's, it's quite a striking way. So now, yeah. basi basically, you, it's an interesting point you mentioned that the brain doesn't find much reference in the Vedic literature. So when you say that biologically, Ayurveda does know that there is an organ called brain. But in the Vedic model of consciousness, the brain doesn't play much role. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Well, of course, if we look in the Bhagavatam, Srimad Bhagavatam, we'll find that there's an analysis of the different elements. So we got the subtle elements like Prakriti and Mahatva and uh, Ahankara or false ego. And we got mind and we get intelligence and chitta. Hmm. And then we get the, the gross elements. But even the gross elements are very subtle. So we get uh, ether, fire, air, fire, water, earth. These are also very subtle. We can't even see those elements. <laughs> it's only when they combine together that we get the visible world that we know. So in themselves, even those elements are very subtle. Besides that, we have other elements called senses. The eye, the ear, the nose. These are called elements. They're also invisible. So also we the elements are different eye. from the organs. Yeah. This is the eye that we call the eye is completely different from that eye or that nose. Of course, the function is the same, we can say, but that's a very subtle eye. It actually goes with your subtle body when you die. It goes into your next body. Oh. Okay. So we have the subtle body with subtle senses, subtle mind and all this. Uh, that's one level of uh, not consciousness itself, but it, it helps hold the consciousness of the Atma. And then we got the gross manifestations, the brain, and the eye that we know of, and the ear, etc., the, the, the gross organs. So 
we got two levels of the, the, the and, and, and the Bhagavatam is not speaking about the gross level. So Ayurveda, to some degree, is dealing with the gross level, and we know that, uh, uh, the, I think, Shashruta, he was doing operations on the brain and whatever, uh, other parts of the body, so he was familiar with that. But as far as the Vedas, they don't, then Puranas, they don't really deal with that gross body at all. They're dealing with a more subtle body with senses and mind. That's remarkable. I never thought about this so, so explicitly. So the main difference, main reason why we are differentiating between, say, the sensory organs and the sense is because yeah. the sense is set to go from one body to another. Whereas the sensory organ is a part of the yes. physical body. Yeah, and we know from Bhagavatam that when Paranjana died, he yeah. took his mind, his senses, his pranas with him. <laughs> well, obviously, that's not the gross senses which are left yes. in your body and rot in the grave or get burned in the fire for the, you know, the funeral or whatever, but it, it's a, another set of senses. So this also explains why you can go out of your body and have out-of-the-body experiences, because you can use your subtle senses, not your gross sense. You may yes, be brain dead for a few minutes, but you can go out with that other body, and even if your brain isn't operating and your senses aren't operating, you can perceive things and think things and remember things, because you're using your subtle mind and your subtle senses. Yes, ma'am. I was going to mention that point itself right now when you mentioned it before, but out of body experiences. Yeah. So also there is this whole idea of some people say they can project themselves outside their body. And yeah. that also Astral travel. <laughs> yeah, that's travel. Yeah. So yeah. just not necessarily related to a direct topic, but during dreams. So is it that in some cases we might be going out of our bodies or is it just a thought uh, we, going somewhere? We could, but normally uh, there are people that do it. In fact, I was here in New Goberdon and <laughs> one devotee says, oh, last night I had a dream and I was traveling out of my body and came up to the temple and I was looking inside the temple, but actually there was no temple there. In the 80s, there was no temple there, but I was looking at the temple. So he kind of went out of his body, but his perception of the world was quite different. Oh, okay. So with that subtle, uh, subtle senses, you may perceive something different from what we have here. Yes, okay. Maharaj. Also, um, this also relates to other things um, where people consciously try to go out. Of course, we have uh, what we call astral projection. People try to do that. And more scientifically, people like uh, I think Monroe uh, Institute, they try to use uh, you know sounds on balancing your <laughs> left and right ears or something like this, or brain nonsense. And then they get you into a trance sort of state and you go out of your body and you can do different things. So. Uh, it's getting a little more you know, common in the modern world and maybe a little more scientific. But on another level, we have persons like um, uh, investigation of what we call remote viewing, which was yes. developed by the military. And they used a clairvoyant to do that, one Ingo Swan in America. Yeah. And uh, one physicist, Hal Putoff, was put in charge of the investigations to see if it was bogus or whether it was actual that you could go out of your body and perceive things thousands of miles away and come back to your body again. So yeah. after many rigorous experiments with this clairvoyant, he said, yes, it is true. We don't know how it operates, but you can do that. You can go beyond space and you can also go beyond time. Oh. So in other words, Ingo Swan could not only go to the moon or to Jupiter or anywhere in the universe, theoretically, uh, he could also go in different times. He could go 3,000 years back or 200 years in the future, whatever. So oh. that was the conclusion of uh, Ingo Swan, the physicist, <laughs> uh, who's still alive, I think. Uh, not Ingo Swan, the, the uh, help of who was the physicist behind. He says, we don't know how it works, but it is definitely true that uh, the human mind can go out of the body and go beyond space and time. Oh, okay. So you could have a different perception completely from what we see in this world. <laughs> oh. Maharaj, can you just repeat the name of the scientist and maybe some reference for this? Oputov. Hal Oputov. O-P-U-T-O-P-H. O-P-U-T-O-F-F. Hal Hal Oputov. Uh, he's uh, was uh, American, and he did his research, I think, at Stanford University, oh, okay. California, uh, sponsored by the CIA. Yeah. And uh, Ingo Swan, who also wrote a whole detailed, uh, you know. <laughs> Summary of what he did there, the experiments they did with him. 
Uh, he's written a whole book on that. In that book, he also refers to Sadaputa's uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> books <laughs> because there, there's a, a, the whole idea of uh, going out of your body, like with the Pranjana story. He says this could be a model for us because how put uh, the uh, Ingo Swan, who's a clever one, he doesn't know how it operates either. <laughs> he just oh. goes out of his body, but he's not. He doesn't know how it happens really. So he said this idea of the subtle body kind of separating or projecting itself away from this gross body and mm-hmm. going beyond space and time. He says that this, this, this idea of the uh, uh, Bhagavatam could be a nice model for us to explain it. Yes, Maharaj. <coughs> there is also a Buddhist researcher, Dean Radin, who has done a lot of research in this field. And he, he has also done meta research, which brings together uh, various studies. And it seems it is becoming increasingly credible you know, that uh-huh, yeah. the idea of there being something at least worth researching in the paranormal domain. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, Manaj. So there have been other people also experimenting in this field. Some of it is maybe discredited or, you know, controversial yeah, or whatever. But nevertheless, they, they, they did work. I think um, John was one person in uh, America also, Professor mm-hmm. John. He did experiments to see if you could move things with your mind, etc. So there have been various people uh, doing this. So anyway, the, many of these people who do the research, they understand that the mind, or what they call the mind, is something quite different from our normal conception of some abstract coming out of the brain. It, it, it is very, very powerful, and it's like it has a force of its own, and, but it doesn't operate by the same uh, physical laws as normal objects in this world. So it is real, and therefore it has a force, as an energy, but it doesn't operate in the same space and time as the normal world we know of. Oh, okay. This kind of puts us on another level that even not spiritual perception, even uh, higher material perception may be quite, mm-hmm. give us a, a different view of this whole world. Like uh, I mentioned that the whole Bhagavatam presentation of the universe looks very different from what we think it is uh, mm-hmm. in the modern world because we're limited to you know, our, our gross senses and what we see from a rocket ship or a telescope or whatever. But there could be other ways of looking at the whole physical world, which may be quite different from what we view. But you cannot communicate that back. So you have to use images of this world and, and stick it back into three dimensions. And then it looks ridiculous because of that. Oh. So when we talk about the, the whole universe with the Mount Meru in the middle and islands and lotuses and stuff, and we say, well, that's, that's like a fairy tale. <laughs> but it's a way of conveying something from someone who's had the vision and they try to convey it back and it looks ridiculous because it's not the same dimension. You know, it's not the same space. It's not the same time. So it looks a little different and it's very difficult to describe it. Okay. So let me try to uh, trace the flow of thought. So one was the idea of intuitive and uh, logical ways of looking at the world. That's one yeah. point. And the second yes. was all these paranormal phenomena. Yeah. Which, for which there is some scientific evidence. And the yeah. third is the, uh, say, the Bhagavatam's vision of the universe. So, so all the common thread linking all three is that all these point that there could be levels of reality and ways of perceiving those levels, which may not be accessible by our normal scientific method. Is that the common yeah. strain of thought? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and I think modern science also realizes this in a very maybe disappointing way. <laughs> they say we they try to analyze the material world and then they say, well, yeah, but uh, we know maybe 3%. The other 97% we call dark matter. Yeah. That's we don't know what it is. It, it's not the matter that we know. So in other words, it could be something like property and <laughs> and consciousness and, you know, material consciousness, so many things that we may be there, even the material elements on their subtle level, which are beyond our you know, definition in, in the modern world. So, you know, there's, we can't say that modern science is absolute. They got, you know, just the 3%, yeah. they know something. And the, the 97%, they don't know. So uh, maybe if they go to the next level, they could get a little more into that. It's not the highest level, but it's just another level and a subtle level. Then they could, uh, you know, uh, discover a little more about the world. And if they do that, then they would get a little bit of 
bordering on spiritual, if we can say at that point, you get, because one not when they get the level they never sense a higher level still, then they would get the spiritual yeah. level. Yes, Maharaj, this is a very we could say very intelligible way of presenting the Bhagavatam cosmology. Otherwise, it yeah. can seem very absurd. And we can seem yeah. as if we are we are ridiculous people for even conceive, believing something like this. Yeah. yeah. So basically, first step would be that we get uh, rational people to accept that science doesn't have a monopoly on knowing reality. That science yeah. is one way of looking at it, or modern science we could say. And uh, there are there could be other ways of looking at the world. And science yeah. is also pointing, even modern scientific methods are pointing toward that. Yes. So yeah. now, of course, quantum physics itself points toward that. Because yes, quantum right. physics kind of upset this whole idea of everything is stuck in a certain place and time, and that you know everything's 3D world and uh, in, a, in a flow of time. And then we get quantum physics that it goes beyond that, and, and material itself kind of dissolves and uh, location in time and space also dissolves into probability uh, and then they end up with a lot of problems that they haven't solved in the last hundred and so odd years since they discovered quantum physics so they, they haven't solved that problem because they haven't got that next level they're still trying to figure this out within the normal science and it do doesn't work and they, no matter what they do they can't they can't solve the problem so therefore they will be forced to go to a higher level beyond their you know limitations of time and space and whatever at the moment that they have yes Maharaj. i had done a podcast with akhanda Deep prabhu a couple of a month or so ago and he said a very yeah. interesting thing that he said science begins with a matter-based approach to reality whereas if we start with consciousness and yeah. then try to come toward matter it would be a, lead to a very different way of looking at things so yes well it, this is what quantum physics does. <laughs> it, it hits at it because when you observe a small thing like an electron or a photon, mm. it acts like a particle or a wave, depending on how you want to test it. Yeah. So in other words, your consciousness decides the reality of a small particle or a wave. So that, that's kind of weird how, how consciousness and matter are related. So that's what they cannot solve in quantum physics because they're still they can't accept the consciousness as a real thing and what is it it goes beyond their definition so you know it's, it's difficult to solve and it's difficult to test it also yes Manaj. that's true so now just uh, take this forward that i would say that most scientifically serious people won't really object to the point that science doesn't know reality exhaustively Science is like a yeah, well, most, ser most serious scientists will accept that. Yeah. So yeah. somehow some of the most popular spokespersons of science in today's world happen to be aggressive atheists. So, yeah. so in a sense, we could say science is one body of knowledge and atheism yeah. is ideology, but atheism yeah. being mis atheism is misappropriating science to propagate its own ideology in some ways. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, and of course, it, it'll fail because it, it's limited. When we go into this purely materialistic, atheistic mode, and we say that nothing else exists, consciousness doesn't exist, then you limit yourself, and then you cannot explain even quantum physics. So you, you get stuck that way. So I think quantum physics is forcing us to go beyond the modern the, or the, the Newtonian model and, and go beyond that and include consciousness. Whatever that is, the science will try to define, but at least it, it puts us a step above the normal thing. And from when we get consciousness, then we can, from that we can get up to, you know, spirit, soul, or God. But that, that's a big step to take. But at least we get the idea of something beyond matter. <laughs> that, that's a big step to make. Yes, my, that's true. So now, so if I understand right, when we say the Bhagavatam's model is Bhagavatam is offering a particular vision of the cosmos to we are not yeah. saying that the scientific vision of the cosmos is wrong. So this is one no. way of looking at the universe and that is another yeah. way of looking at the universe. Well, that's my idea. <laughs> How I interpret the Bhagavatam. Okay. <laughs> yeah, to solve the problem. <laughs> Sorry? 
But it, otherwise, we're stuck on the, all the scientists are wrong. Uh, when you go up in the, in the spaceship, they're lying to us, and the, and the world isn't round. It, it, it's flat. But they're, they're distorting the photographs. They're photo, photoshopping them or something like that. You can yeah. use that argument and say that everything is false. Or, you know, you can go the other way and, and say that, you know, the bottom is only imaginary or whatever like that. So we're, either way, we, we have to go to extreme steps on so this way, if we understand it in terms of perception, then we can you know, correlate the two. For instance, if a yogi or anybody who's a, a paranormal person could skillfully go out of their body and perceive the universe, what would they see? They would see something different from what the scientist sees. Yeah. yeah. So this is what we can say, a yogic vision of the universe. It's not a spiritual vision. It's a material vision with the let's say, a higher dimension beyond the normal space and time that we know. But how they would draw that and how they would convey that to us may be a little would be difficult to do here <laughs> because we have to come back into our space and time to explain it, and then it looks strange because of, of how you want to explain it. You know? So there's a difficulty in, in communicating a higher level of perception to our, and to redefine it in terms of our normal world. That's maybe a problem in, in spiritual subject matters itself. Yes, Maj. This is, so if I may envision what you said as a pendulum, so one extreme of the pendulum is to say that the scientific vision of the universe is wrong. The other extreme of the pendulum is to say that the Bhagavatam is imaginary. But yeah, yeah. between we could have that these are two different modes of perception. Yes, and, yes, yes. Why not? Yes, Maj. Yeah. And I think yeah. this is... Just like we can say that Normally, Newtonian physics, that is okay. It works in this material world as far as normal things are concerned. But then the quantum physics view is another view, which is completely opposite in one, many ways. So it's also there, and it also has its use. So it's another way of looking at the world. Uh, and then, then we go beyond that to more extreme views of the world also. Yes, my, that's, that's actually, this is a good example, even within the world of science itself, that science yeah, itself we has have different been, levels. Yeah, different ways of looking at the yeah. world. So, yeah. But if you try to force it back it, it, into the, our, our normal world, then we can't explain anything. So that's why they got stuck in quantum physics. And even Einstein was puzzled what to do with this discovery he had. He didn't want to, he was uncomfortable with it. Yes. Because, because they couldn't get to the next level. They, they wanted to try to stick it within our normal experience. <laughs> Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, when you're using the word levels, say I was using the word like different w ways of perception. So yeah. by levels, are you saying that one is higher and one is lower or levels is also more or less the same as ways? Well, we can say a gross and subtle. Okay. So this is for the scientific way and the Bhagavatam's way. So one is gross. Well, even science. Even science could go on the gross level and a subtle level and a subtle level if it advances. Okay. And, and until until we get to the level where they could accept Bhagavatam. Yes. <laughs> Actually, so you're saying the quantum would be a little more subtler way of looking at things. Yeah. Yeah. If they could solve their problem, then we would have a more subtle science. Yes. Of course, I think Rasaraj is also going in that direction of trying to retrain uh, the scientists to think in a different way. Yes. which is a more subtle science. <laughs> yes, he's bringing in semantics, information and yeah. semantics as a foundation of science. Yes, that's fascinating. Now, I read yeah. in the philosophy of science, I read a very interesting way of presenting the conflict between, say, Newtonian physics and quantum physics, hmm. so, which I tried to put in our way of looking at things. See, we have Pratyaksha, Anuman and Shabda. So... Mm -hmm. Newtonian physics starts with Pratyaksha and comes to Anuman. Okay, yes. why do objects fall? We have come up with theories about that. Whereas, uh, quantum physics starts with Anuman and then tries to come to Pratyaksha. By Anuman, okay. quantum physics works in terms of the theories are very elegant, the math is remarkable, and it works. The calculations work. But when we try to yeah. take the quantum physics view and try to visualize it, we just can't visualize it. It's difficult. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, if, it's a, if everything is just waves, then why do, why do we perceive it as tangible objects? 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, so then that means even if you put Shabda aside, within science itself, whether we start, we give empirical primary or we whether give the theoretical primary primacy, science has different ways of yeah. looking at it. And yeah. uh, both of which, both of which are limited. <laughs> okay, yes, and both of them are limited and both of them work within their field and uh, their particular yeah. mode of living. Interestingly, you know, even if we don't go to the spiritual, actually, even both these models of science also actually don't describe reality as we experience it. Because say mm -hmm. we, we experience qualia, we experience taste yeah. and color and fragrance, mm -hmm. but yeah. none of these are actually, uh, they don't have any tangible existence within either of the theories. So, yeah, 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 yeah. so, you know, maybe we could envision experience is not included in it. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Experience. Yeah. The whole experiential aspect. Yeah. So then, if, yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, you're saying something, Maharaj? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, a Newtonian physics, I suppose, ever from that point onwards, from uh, when Newton started, then uh, reality meant just objects. Yes, my uh, divorced from consciousness, uh, divorced from experience. Yes, my because they felt that experience interfered with the reality. In other words, spiritual life and Bible and God interfered and put prejudices on us to uh, perceive the world in a in a distorted way. So they gave up the whole spiritual aspect completely, and therefore we get this duality between the let's say the left brain and right brain, heavily left brain. Let's just observe everything in three dimensions and logical things using perce sense perception and anuman, uh, you know, inference. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's true in one sense, uh, but it, it's not everything. <laughs> yes, Maharaj. You know, when I studied the history of science, you know, just at the time of uh, Galileo and others, they decided to divide observed reality into two qualities or two properties primary and secondary mm. and according to them the primary properties are those which are measurable so yeah. length height density viscosity uh, luminosity all those and yeah. everything else is secondary so taste yeah. fragrance beauty yeah. all those are secondary uh -huh. so what, what we call as experience as yeah. you rightly put it that was considered secondary and their main reason from what i read was of course one factor is the contradiction between science and Christianity, but another was they felt that experience is subjective. Maybe just to try to put visually, say one circle is the, if we have a Venn diagram, one circle is the circle of our experienced reality. Mm? Yeah. Within that, partially intersecting it is say the circle of Newtonian physics. Then it, they could have another circle, which yeah. is the quantum physics. So it's like a Venn diagram. Yeah. None of these describes even our experience. What to speak of something which is beyond yeah. our experience. So now, yeah. so within, just like within science, there are different ways of looking at reality. Even within scripture also, there are different ways of looking at the universe. It's like say within Jyotisha Shastras and yeah. in the Puranas. Yeah. There are different ways of looking at reality. Yeah. And traditionally, yeah. the two have not been considered contradictory. Isn't it, Maharaj? Yeah. Yes. So we see that uh, many of these uh, scientists and ancient any of the mathematicians and uh, uh, astronomers, they were actually Brahmins. So they were raised with the Vedas and they never rejected the Vedas. But then they went on with science. And then they they like they, they said okay the uh, the Earth is uh, spherical or whatever like this and it rotates you know and they explain eclipses in another way not like Rahu and Ketu etc. Uh, but they didn't reject the Puranic version uh, in favor of their scientific version, which was not true in the Western world. There was a war between religion and science, and then science won. Huh? Uh, but in, in, in the ancient India, the, the two things that were in one mind, one person had both visions in his mind, and it wasn't a conflict for him, which means his mind was operating on, let's say, the practical level of normal Newtonian-type physics, and the other on a much higher level, a 
of course, we can understand because they had spiritual background, they could accept that they, they were there were different versions of reality. Yes. Which means that there may be another level of left brain, right brain. They they, they could work both brains <laughs> and accept both versions of both brains. <laughs> oh, okay. This is quite intriguing to consider that. I read one of the differences between, say, the Western and the Eastern way of looking of things is the Western has always been this or that, but the Eastern is this and yeah. that. So it's not so much or as yeah. that. Yes, Maharaj. So then, uh, yeah. if we consider it that way, then say in our movement, we are trying to depict the planetarium. So, so the three issues that come up. First is that, uh, say, as you said, if if it's a yogic vision, then how much is it possible for us to depict it through physical architecture? That's one question. You uh, cannot. You cannot. <laughs> Oh really? Okay. So then, because if it, you you could do it in one level, let's say if you used um, holograms and uh, make a light show of some sort, you could kind of approach that type of other dimensional reality or hmm. higher dimension of reality. But if you're just going to use models like a ball to represent the sun and a ball to represent the moon and a ball to represent the earth and make them, and then we're back to uh, Newtonian. And that's it. And then, and then it doesn't look very uh, convincing. <laughs> yes, Maharaj. So, Maharaj. So, you know, it, it, unless we have some other type of presentation, it's not going to convince people that algorithm is right and science is wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, Maharaj. It's going to look like a mythology. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, is it possible to... Yeah. Maybe the way is we, uh, we invent a machine a vendor machine to get people to stimulate the right brain <laughs> and they could understand everything. Oh, okay. That's amazing. That's true. <laughs> there, there are some experiments where, not exactly you could say mainstream experiments, but where people are exposed to certain uh, calming music or some meditational, meditational, meditation inducing kind of uh, stimuli. And they do seem to yeah. Uh, calm down and see things from a not necessarily a radically different perspective, but a significantly different perspective. Yeah. Yes, Maharaj. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the in the tradition itself, uh, apart from the fact that, say, these two, the Jyoti Shastras and the Puranic cosmology, they have both existed. But is there any reference within, say, the Bhagavatam itself, which indicates that? Uh, what is being offered is from a yogic vision because at one level the Bhagavatam is a linear narrative going on and it is describing events yeah. either happen on the earth or on some other planets but then yeah. the yeah, yeah. Also, when Parikshit is asked, Parikshit Maharaj is asking the question is there any indication over there that what is being described is a yogic vision? Well, in one sense um... Uh, this is all spoken by Sukhadev Goswami, yes. who's not just having a yoga vision, <laughs> he's on the highest level of spiritual life. Yes, <laughs> so in one sense, everything he describes is we have to think of it as being also on another level, perhaps. For instance, we can take all the stories of Krishna's pastimes. Yes, we can take them on the normal level we do. Okay, Krishna's walking down the path in the forest. Krishna goes to the Jumuna River. Uh, Krishna bathes in the river with his friends or whatever like that. So we can just take it like we normally see things in this material world. But actually it, it is quite different because it's a spiritual world. So there's another level of realizing that same pastime from the spiritual point of view mm -hmm. in which it takes on a, a, another uh, different experience. <laughs> We're experiencing with our limited type of material, you know, uh, senses and brain, but uh, if we get spiritualized enough, then we can enter into the spiritual aspect of it. So in other words, the Bhagavatam looks like material words and material concepts, but actually it is spiritual. Yes, Maharaj. That's, you know, with respect to 10th Canto, that's perfectly, it's Krishna's pastime directly. Uh, but what about yeah. other descriptions? Say, for example, when we have Kardama and Dehuti talking or Vidura and uh, Maitreya talking, 
or Uddhava talking. Yeah. There are all these conversations. Yeah. Then yeah. not everything in the Bhagavatam is necessarily describing things at another level of reality. So, yeah. the, well, but, in one sense, because they involve devotees, <laughs> like Kapila or Devahuti, they're all devotees. So, yes, it operates and it looks it's in a historical time and place, etc. But it, it also has another reality, a higher reality to it also that probably we cannot appreciate at this time. Uh, so the, similarly, the Bhagavatam description, okay, it operates because we're talking about the world and the universe, etc. But uh, obviously, the description of the universe as Bhagavatam describes, not only Bhagavatam, other things also with the seven upper worlds and the seven lower worlds and uh, the dvipas and the oceans, etc., is, is quite foreign to our <laughs> perceptional level at this point in time. Uh, so how do we explain it? So it can only be explained if, if there is a higher vision of uh, the world, that's all. So certain things we can explain uh, on, with our normal consciousness, other things are maybe a little more difficult to explain. So yes, now just from a, if I may take a slightly a devil's advocate, that we could say that, you know, because we want, because you want to ensure that this is not dismissed as mythology, you are just introducing this concept of uh, higher levels of reality. The Bhagavatam doesn't itself refer to them. So, you know, yeah. because, because in one sense, there are some skeptics who say yeah. quantum physics is being misused by anyone and everyone to introduce everything, everything which is <laughs> illogical and crazy as if it is acceptable by using quantum physics. And I, I've also yeah. seen in a lot of... Yeah lot of strange ideas people just use some quantum yeah. mumbo jumbo and they try to make it sound credible so like yeah. now one point you made is that Shukdev Goswami himself is a yogi hmm? but when Parishima yeah. is asking him questions he is talking about history isn't it isn't it okay but he's talking about say for example uh, there are various uh, manvantaras and what happened in the manvantaras that's being described so, yeah. is there any reference in the Bhagavatam to indicate that its cosmological description is uh, different from what would be normally perceived? Now, I was talking with one devotee, Hari Parshat Prabhu, and he said that you know, if, Shukde, if Parishat Maharaj wanted a normal, wanted a normal description of the cosmos, you know, he could just have observed it with his own eyes. He wanted a higher yeah. description. That's why he asked him the question. So does that sound reasonable yeah. also? Yeah. Well, um, uh, we see in the Bhagavatam itself that there's a description of upper planets like Svargaloka. Mm -hmm. And then those devatas come down to earth sometime. Yes. <laughs> We're getting that other reality it, it going into our reality. It's not the spiritual reality of Krishna's spiritual world, but it's upper planets. And upper regions, or or the sages of Maharaloka or Tapaloka or Brahmaloka coming down and coming to the earth, so we get an intersection there uh, of those higher realms on other so-called other dimensions are invisible to modern science, and they're penetrating into our view. So we do get a little bit of you know other dimensions coming in, and we know that their time is also different. Brahma's one second is you know <laughs> one yeah. year here. That's true. So we get some intersection, a little bit of intersection there of higher so-called higher dimensions. Yes, much. And I think I read in a Ramayan commentary that even when the devatas come to the earth, unless the devatas will, the humans cannot see them, even when they are here. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. yeah. You have to have a certain level of consciousness also to appreciate them. <laughs> yeah, okay. So then the point so which in order to see Brahmaloka or you would have to have a certain level of consciousness. To see Svargaloka, you have to have a certain level of consciousness. Okay. Yes, Maharaj. So then the now we talked about the left brain being more logical, the right brain being more intuitive. So now intuition is that talked about in in terms of levels of consciousness within the Vedic uh, epistemology? Because we have 
two one is the way epistemology is say pratyakshanuman shabd and now i don't know if intuition would mm. fit anywhere in that but then we also have levels of consciousness so there are modes of mm. knowledge, acquiring knowledge and there are levels of consciousness maybe we could i think in the yoga literature they talk about when the prana is at a particular level then things are perceived differently so is intuition talked about in our, mm. our tradition in any way well when you mean intuition what do you mean telling the future seeing the future in no, one no, sense no no not it just in the sense that we talk about because like because if, if if you can do that yeah no if, if, if in other words if you go beyond if you go beyond uh, our sense of time and space then you can see the future or see the past oh. as i said even even uh, ingo swan could go beyond time and space so he could go to jupiter or mars or wherever or he could uh, you know go inside a mountain and look inside a mountain like that and or he could go in time also and see something in the past so i don't know if you want to call that intuition it's just another way of looking at the world which is beyond our space and time so we may call it fantastic like the yogis <laughs> oh okay so no i was using the word intuition in the sense that the left brain and the right brain left brain is logical mm. the right brain is intuitive so in that yeah. case, you are intuitive in that sense so okay so that would include but that right brain would include something like beyond space and time as we know it i would think <laughs> and, and it would mean that um uh you know we're beyond the normal idea of past present future at that point beyond past present and future okay yeah we're, we're beyond that that passage of time so we can perceive things in a different way and we come back to this world and say oh how do you think of that you know or surprised by you know that perception because it's quite different mm. yes maharaj so this is fascinating so I, i i said that i had three questions one was that whether we can depict the bhagavatam's cosmology in our domain mm. so you, you said that it's very difficult unless we use hologram or something like that so now or alter you know alter people's consciousness maybe <laughs> yeah people are we stimulate people's consciousness to rise higher so but it seems in traditional architecture like whether we look at that big temple in the middle in the far east or we we have the meru parvat and others they have been commonly depicted but was it always understood that yes. this, is, this is not necessarily like a literal description it's a description from a higher level uh it's hard to say uh it's there in buddhist buddhism and jainism also that same model uh and we know even angkor wat is it is yeah. a, a model and then the, the dwipas around us it's, it's it's accepted like that that it's, it's it's a model of the universe so that was their way of thinking it so they they put it on to a gross level so to speak but then it becomes a little bit higher because it's a temple so <laughs> it's got spiritualized to some degree yeah no when i <laughs> Yes, sir. When I read about the Puranic cosmology, it seems most of the Puranas agree on the basic uh, structure of the cosmos. It just that depending yeah. on say which particular deity is being worshipped, they put that deity's abode at the topmost level. So, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so the structure of the universe, the hierarchy remains the same, but maybe Vaishnavas yeah. will consider uh, Vaikuntha to be the highest. Shaivites will consider yeah. Shiva's abode to be the highest. but this will yeah. consider nirvana to be above that so yeah. it seems that that was a we could say a cross cultural or a cross cross theological uh, pan indian yeah. vision of the universe at that time yeah it goes beyond india also because the norse in norway also had a similar structure of the universe with a big tree in the middle oh i don't know the tree on it in the middle and other cultures also have a similar idea and they also have a snake somewhere in the whole cosmology as well <laughs> like on other shashas there so there's a common theme so of course it doesn't doesn't look rational in the modern world to say okay somewhere in the universe is a snake you know crawling around or whatever or there's a big tree a huge monstrous tree or a huge mountain and doesn't look you know i would think that it's more like their images as i say where when you get into the right brain 
you don't think in terms of logic. You, you record things in terms of images. So it's like a lotus, it's like a tree, it's like this. And then we convey that back and it looks a little strange. And, and when we come back to our dimension, of how can there be a big lotus or how can there be a big tree? But they describe these things like that. So it could be, you know, uh, like an analogy for something else also possible. Oh. But that's why I, in, in my presentation, I said that even the whole, it, it can operate on different levels, as Sadhubhuta also said. We, it can be like, you know, India with the Himalayas and then pineapple on one side and India on another side and, you know, whatever like this, you know. Or it can be a vision of the world with Mount Meru being North Pole. And then flatten out all the continents and make that like the, the Bu Mandala. Or it can be the uh, solar system. Yes. With all the planets revolving like that, with islands and dweepas with their, their, the radius of their, or their, the dimensions of their orbit, like that. Or we can go beyond that, we can go to the galaxy. And that the galaxy is the, the Bu Mandala. <laughs> yes. Or we can go beyond that, take all the universes together, and then we have this toroidal shape thing with this Mount Meru shape in the middle of it. Mm. So if you go beyond time and space, you could have all of these visions simultaneously, but how do you express it? <laughs> <laughs> So they may express it as, a, you know, a Mount Meru with the, the Dwipas and things like this in oceans. Yes, Maharaj. Now, Sadaput Prabhu's presentation was very sophisticated. And one thing I observed is that generally when talking with people, if we give them various explanations, it could be like this, it could be like this, it could be like Frustrated. this. Frustrated. No, not necessarily. <laughs> they find something that makes sense to them. Yeah. And I find it a little more, they find it, okay, this doesn't make sense, but this makes sense to me. But if we just directly say, this is like this, yeah. and that is wrong, then that appears a little more uh, uh, difficult for them to accept. So, yeah. of course, some devotees, some people might be like that, that oh, you're just giving so many explanations. But yeah, Sadhaput Prabhu's presentation, I found to be one of the most uh, sophisticated, and the way you explained it, that this could be a, this could be a vision or an image which cannot really be described in our, which cannot really precisely be put in our time and space. So, yeah. yeah. Somehow we seem to have a little paranoia to using the word non-literal. Uh, Sadaput Prabhu used the word non-literal yeah. and he was quite, he was yeah. by some people for that. So, yeah. are, are there any alternative terminologies that we could use for this, like use the word, it could be meta, it could be like metaphorical, but sometimes some people oh. might talk by that also, but what, uh, what, what terms can we use for describing this? You have any? Um, oh, I don't know. Maybe in, in theology, they may have some term for that where, where they don't want to use that. It's in a real speculative or interpretive, but it could have different levels of meaning. There may be a word for that in, Yes, my. You know, in, 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 in philosophy or in uh, theology or something. I don't know. I don't know myself, but it could be uh, something there like that. But um, I, think I think some people that deal with, uh, you know, myths and stuff like that, they, they talk about myths and uh, appreciate the mythologies of the world, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, you know, being Carl Jung, he was appreciating that there was some uh, archetypal <laughs> things yeah. behind, psychological things behind that, whatever. So, um, that's of course on on psychological level, but we can say that that also becomes a reality that there are levels of reality that it's not just a mental thing in your mind, but they're actually real as well. So it's not just symbol. The symbol is reality on one level, but it's difficult for us on our gross consciousness to accept that a symbol is a symbol, but a symbol can be reality also on a higher level. In the spiritual world, of course, everything becomes real. Whatever you think of becomes real. So, you know, uh, the, the the representation or the metaphor or the symbol actually, normally we think, you know, we, we can't do that because we have to take the direct meaning of the words or whatever like that. But we also know that scripture itself has many levels of meaning. So we got in, in the first verse of Bhagavatam, uh, you know, Vishwanath and Jiva describe it in five or six different ways, completely different meanings of the same words. <laughs> yeah. So we can't say, oh, you're interpreting. <laughs> This is the nature of uh, spiritual literature itself, that it has meaning to it. So we can say the whole concept of the universe could have different levels of meaning 
as is presented in the Bhagavad also. That's amazing. It's we quite fairly accept the point that one verse can have different meanings. So if one verse can have different meanings, then yeah. one then the one universe can also be described in different ways. And then so we could say, yeah. you know, that levels is a very acceptable way of looking at it. The different levels of reality and different levels of perceiving those realities. So something could be metaphorical, yeah, yeah, yeah. something could be metaphorical, yeah. and simultaneously it could also yeah. be metaphysical. So metaphorical yeah, yeah. That just means it's symbolic, but it's meta metaphysical, it's describing a reality beyond the physical. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. And, and Vishnu Chakrabarti, in, in discussing the um, Chatra Sloki of the Bhagavad Gita, also the last verse, he gives a, a Gana level meaning for Ganis. He gives another just a, a, a literal, very literal meaning. And then he gives a rasa meaning <laughs> for the devotees involving prema and bhakti. <laughs> so we got three different, you know, versions of the same verse and it means quite different things. <laughs> yeah. But we, we can't accuse him of interpreting, you know, or going beyond the direct meaning of words because he also says that Bhagavatam in some senses is prokshavad. It speaks indirectly. Yeah, it does not always give the direct meaning of things. It hides the meaning sometimes, so we have to be careful also that we can't always take literal, literal meanings. So that's why we have to rely on the acharyas. <laughs> but unfortunately, they don't speak about this universe too much and, and describe why it's like that. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, just I remember another verse. I think eleventh canto yeah, that was tekta sudasta jesurep sita where the same verse is used to describe Ram, Krishna, and Lord Chaitanya by Vishnachikra Thakur. So, yes, the same yes. Yes, yes. so then, you know, so we could say that the first question was that, is this depictable? Well, in some ways, but we have to have some caveats that this is not, when we depict it physically, it's not exactly the same mm -hmm. as what it is actually. So, so that is the first point. The second point is, you know, when we depict the universe, you now what do you understand is the purpose for doing that? You know, is that uh, the fifth canto uh, description of the universe, it's not exactly spiritual. It's like at a different material level. So, you know, why, is mm. it, why do you feel is it so important for us to actually depict it, say, in our international headquarters, Means what? What is the object? Oh, okay. Yeah. That? If it cannot be accurately well, from the point. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, well, from the point of view of Sukadev Goswami, he presents the universe a description in order to show the skill of the Lord <laughs> in operating in the material world. Huh? And of course, the idea is that he makes places for all types of living entities, from the highest and Brahma Loka down to the lowest and Patala Loka. And he gives all varieties of uh, places and experiences and bodies for living entities. So that's the genius of the Lord. So that's what it's supposed to show. Oh. But it may be for people of higher consciousness, because we in the modern world, we can't accept that you know, there's higher planets up the Brahma Loka because we don't see them. And, you know, that there's a Mount Meru in the middle and all this. We, <laughs> we can't accept that. But you should not accept it. <laughs> That was, you know, yeah, that's true. That, that his, in his age, which is a few hundred years ago, they were accepting it. They didn't question it at all. But it's difficult for us to accept in the modern world. So in other words, they had a different vision of <laughs> reality, the material reality even. So now we're in a, a different stage of, you know, <laughs> what is real world. Yes, ma'am. Of course, like a, 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 a Rasaraj says that you look at a table and you see the table. And, and we have a common definition of the table and everybody looks at the same table they more or less get the same description they give, they'll give you the same description but it's, it's not actually the table <laughs> we're seeing that table and commonly we're seeing that same table but actually the table is something quite different from that we don't seeing the reality so <laughs> yeah in a sense so actually <laughs> we don't really the objective world is it's filled with so many details that we can't take it all. So we usually have more like a purpose centered vision of the world. Yeah, this yes, is, an yes. object, is an object for me to place things. That is a place where I can. And see. I think uh, people are modern people are trained up from childhood to see things in a certain way. 
If mm -hmm. they don't see like that, then they consider backwards. Okay? So that's why primitive peoples who are introduced to modern civilization, they can't make sense of it. They can't understand why you're doing this, why you're living in a house, why you have AC in your house, why why everybody has to work so hard. <laughs> so they sit back and they're, they, you call them lazy because they're looking at you and wondering, what are these people doing running around like this? Because they, they're, they're seeing the world differently. You know, they're in a different mode. So similarly, the people in India, ancient India, were seeing in a different way, and they didn't question what was in the scripture at all. They, they, they could see the world through the eyes of scripture. But nowadays, we, we're all trained up in the scientific mode, and then we have to question everything. Yeah. You know, this, you talk about primitive people, I just remembered, Bhakti Sudhan Sui Thakur, in one of his Bengali essays, Bengali, Bengali Samajikta, he says that the Eastern mode of living focused more on the Jnana Indriyas, observing the universe. Whereas mm. the Western mode of living yeah. focused more on the Karma Indriyas, doing something with the universe. Oh, okay. <laughs> and he says that for those who have focused on the Karma Indriyas, life, with the Gyan, life centered on the Jnana Indriyas will seem very lazy. Why yeah. not doing anything? Okay. On the other hand, people who are centered on Jnana Indriyas, for them, life with the Karma Indriyas will seem unnecessarily busy. Why are you running around? What are you going to achieve by all this? Yeah. And uh, so it reminds yeah. me of something similar to what you said. So yeah, Mahesh, different worldview. <laughs> yeah, different worldview. So Mahesh, this brings me to a third question now. That, uh, that when, say, a person, a new devotee comes up, or a new person becomes a devotee, or even a devotee who is studying the scriptures, yeah. they find, if that devotee finds it difficult to say, understand or accept the fifth canto cosmology, uh, so how central is that in terms of faith? Since there are some things which we can tell, you know, okay, if you don't understand, you can just leave it in a state of suspe suspended judgment, you could say, like put in the bracket. Yeah. Don't accept it. Don't yeah. reject it. Just put it aside and continue studying the Bhagavatam. So, is it yeah. a is it a central faith issue that somebody has to accept the fifth canto cosmology before they can actually develop love for Krishna, or it's not yeah. that central? Yeah. Well, it's like I said. The whole purpose was to show the skill of the Lord in in, in making this universe so that the living entities could live in different levels so at least that much they can appreciate so we get all these different places for living entities in higher and lower planets and different dvipas and different varshas etc so if they can appreciate that that there are uh different places for living entities to live many of which are invisible to us i find then you don't have to worry about the details of where the locas are where the dvipas are where mount Meru is and just leave it at that uh you know and later on they can say that just says we cannot really understand everything about Krishna. So we cannot understand everything about the description of the universe also, which is material. We don't know. That's all. Leave it at that. Okay. The one thing we do appreciate that the whole thing is very symmetrical. <laughs> they work out in great detail the, the number of yojanas this way and that way, and it all works out very nicely. The, the width of the universe, the height of the universe, uh, uh, the height of Mount Meru, the base of Mount Meru, uh, the the dvipas and how each one is double the diameter of the last dvipa, etc. It was all worked out in very uh, symmetrical proportions, just yeah. like that when they, they draw the mandala, which is basically a, a, a diagram of the universe, just a, a big nice circle and a square, and another circle and a lotus in the middle. So the whole universe is very symmetrical. In other words, there is an intellect behind this is making the whole universe very beautiful. <laughs> But that's how we appreciate the Supreme Lord. Yeah, that's beautiful. There's a, from an aesthetic perspective, there's symmetry. And in fact, uh, at least yeah. early scientists, when they, drew, they conceived the planetary orbits and all that, they also appreciate the artistry behind the vision of the universe. So, yeah. If, yeah. Yeah, so if, uh, if the purpose is to say, further some appreciation of God and God consciousness, then for some mm. people in today's, who grow up in today's scientific education, even the modern scientific cosmology 
can also actually evoke a sense of awe and uh, appreciation not for everyone but for some yeah. that purpose might be served even through th- that this universe is so vast and uh, and it's so magnificent there has to be some brain behind yeah. it. there's some organizing principle behind it yeah well even even einstein admitted it, you know <laughs> we can't say there's not there's, there's nothing there maybe there is maybe there isn't but it looks like there's something there <laughs> yeah. he won't say definitely what it is but he appreciates that there is you know some harmony within the whole physical laws of the universe etc so you know uh more uh, elevated scientists advanced scientists they appreciate that there is some you know some some order within all of the uh, laws of physics yes maraj so in fact einstein from what i read he was not against the concept of god per se because there are statements which seem to be atheistic mm. and some statements of his which seem to be atheistic so it seems that yeah he was more against the concept of god that he would go, he got from the judeo christian tradition but from the yes. tradition of science he felt there has to be some order the ordering principle so yes yeah yeah yes manaj mm-hmm. so then uh, just to, so if it's a generic appreciation of uh, god's greatness that can come from either cosmology and what about some specific uh, contradictions which sometimes come up how much should they be made into faith issues say for example the distance which is closer the moon is closer or the sun is closer or for example mm-hmm. how big is the universe or for example did did we humans go to the moon or not so these are some issues uh-huh. which can become quite uh, uh, quite volatile and can be a big challenge for the faith for some people yeah, yeah. So how, how do mm. how critical are these issues and how can they be addressed well uh, for instance the moon issue uh of course the prophets they didn't go to the moon or whatever except well, if they went they actually didn't enjoy on the moon which is true <laughs> they have to wear space suits they can't enjoy so if you really want to enjoy the moon then you have to do punyas and then in your next body you get a body suitable for enjoying so you, you, it's, it's a different place in other words a different level of consciousness hmm. so you can go on a physical level but you're not going to the moon in the true sense of the uh you know enjoyment <laughs> uh, on, on the enjoyment level, the consciousness level you're not going there so we can say like that yeah so so you can go or not go physically but it, it, there's plenty of ways we could cheat uh, nowadays to <laughs> <laughs> look like you're going to the moon but you don't, didn't go or you go go to america you didn't go to america whatever we have you know you, you we could always say that they're cheating like that it doesn't really matter though because whatever they do they can't they can't get the enjoyment that is described in the uh, vedas uh, by going to the moon mm. that's a very... so that is that that's just one way of explaining that particular example <laughs> yeah, so that's very good right so then we don't in one sense have to place science and scripture uh, in competition that you have to choose no, no. or you have to choose that both can be yeah, 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 have, yeah, both can yeah. have their validity in their place yeah at the same time we should not think that science is absolute some neophyte devotees may think this is science so this is true this is true this is wrong so they have to get out of that mode so a person who has proper faith uh then faith means that he intuitively so to speak <laughs> he will accept the version of scripture even if he can't understand it so that's what faith is yes a, a person who doesn't have faith and has to start questioning immediately uh, we do require faith in order to progress in fact yes maraj but at the same that time, means that we do appreciate to some degree the inexplicable nature of the supreme lord and how spiritual actually is quite different from material we we appreciate that as a matter of faith also yes so we could put it this way that faith means we should be open to the fact that there can be some realities beyond what our senses or our rationality can perceive but that doesn't yeah necessarily, definitely but that yeah, doesn't necessarily yeah. mean that what our senses or reasoning perceives we have to reject that yeah. no that yeah yeah there is more to this but that doesn't mean this is wrong that yeah yeah is, is one way that's right? stated very nicely also by even rupa goswami yeah? 
in the nectar of devotion. He says, if you want to appreciate nectar of devotion with all the rasas and everything about Krishna, you need ruchi. You need a spiritual taste. But then, and then he says, tarka, this logic doesn't work there. But then he says, we don't reject logic also. We also use logic, but it follows after the verdict of the scripture. So we, we accept what is there in the scripture, and then we can use logic to try to correlate it with our normal life and whatever. Mm. But we don't give up. And of course, we use logic to uh, get the meaning of scripture also. So uh, we don't reject logic, but it has its place. And, and in terms of spiritual things, particularly, then we have to take those conclusions and work backwards, accept the conclusions, and then use our logic after that. And then, okay. But to try to speculate our own with logic to come to spiritual conclusion, that's useful. Oh, yes. So, I think, see, similarly, for the other things also, we could come up with explanations. Say, for example, the dimension of the universe or the size yes. of or the list which is higher and lower, moon or sun. There are Sadaputru has come up yeah. with explanations that there's a vertical dimension to the universe. That, oh, that yeah, that, that's quite clear actually. Uh, all they do is they mention the different heights of orbit of the different planets. It doesn't say what the orbit is, but it's the height above Mount Meru, that's all. Oh. Huh? So, but the, the orbit of the sun is way out on Manasakara mountain range, very, very far away, even though it's lower than above Bumandala than the moon is. The moon is at a higher elevation from Bumandala, but its orbit is closer to Bart Varsha and its, its circular orbit is much smaller than the sun's orbit. The sun's got the greatest, the hugest orbit Mm. We are in Monster Mountain Range, which is, you know, <laughs> a lot of Yojanas away. Yeah, so, so it's further away from us, but its, it's, it's elevation above the Bumandala is less than the moon's elevation. Yes, Maharaj. So in modern terms, one way I try to explain this is that, say somebody's in the ground level of a building, and there's a skyscraper yeah. which is 100 level next to it, and yeah. somebody's, at a, there's somebody's at 100 level in that. And then somebody is maybe at yeah. a far distance away, horizontally, but they're in this yeah. third level or fourth level. So yeah. Yeah. Then, then which will be geographically closer, diagonally, that may be different from the height. So yeah. just yeah. what you're saying, isn't it? Just a, yes, Maharaj. Yes. yes sir. And now, uh, see, in the Western, um, way, Western intellectual history, there was a conflict between science and religion because there was a time when some Christians claimed, or at least that was the idea at that time, that, that scripture gives all knowledge, material and spiritual. Yeah. And science, mm. it contradicts scripture, then science should be rejected as heretical. But subsequently, mm. now many scientists, many Christian scientists also say that that was actually a misunderstanding. Like for example, the the idea that a geocentric uh, model of the universe that doesn't come from the Bible yeah. that came from Greek from Ptolemy and other Greeks. thinkers, Greek thinkers. Yeah. So so now in yeah. now Christianity tries to resolve that uh, science religion conflict by compartmentalization. That so in fact Galileo had put it that. Science, science tells us, the Bible tells us how to go to the heavens and scripture, science tells us how the heavens go. So how to go to the heavens, mm -hmm. how the heavens go. <laughs> so now, mm -hmm. is uh, there is some kind of, in, in our tradition, has there been a similar compartmentalization, say of, empirical or scientific knowledge and spiritual knowledge or scriptural knowledge. So means do we, are there any reasons why a science religion conflict or science scripture conflict is less probable or more probable in our tradition? Um, hard to say. I haven't thought about it, but um, as I said, um, it looks like, um, the ancients adjusted it. So the, the, the astronomers, <laughs> they were Brahmanas and they also accepted the Vedas, but they also did their empirical studies mm. and they didn't have, find a contradiction there in, in 
how they adjusted it, I don't know. But I, as I suggested, maybe it's left brain, right brain. They they had cultivated both sides, which means that they had some spiritual realization as well as uh, material intelligence. So then uh, they could adjust the world and look at it both ways without seeing a contradiction. Uh, if we get too du dualistic and uh, emphasize the left brain too much, then we'll have a conflict. Okay. Because we'll try to see everything in terms of the left brain and logic, and then every, the other, other thing doesn't make sense. So we'll get a conflict there. But if the person has got you know a flexibility where these, he can operate in both perspectives, then there'd, there'd be no contradiction. I would assume that that's what happened in ancient India, that they, could, they were intelligent, and they could use their senses and empirically develop science. At the same time, they could progress spiritually, and they didn't see it as contradictory at all. Uh, if we lose the real, uh, let's say, realization aspect of religion, then it becomes simply doctrine, then we fall into problem. Because we'll, we'll take the doctrine and we'll interpret everything literally. <laughs> and then it won't make sense to science or to the, you know, the intelligent person in the world. And then we get this conflict. So when we can say the religion is divorced from realization, then... Uh, it, the, the religion looks fanatical and it looks untrue and therefore the conflict. Huh? If the person has realization, then he'll have see no conflict between the, the two worlds. That's profound, Maharaj. Religion without realization is fanatical. Yeah, and in one sense, our tradition has various paths of yoga by which we can get realizations. Yeah. Whereas Christianity doesn't yes. have doesn't have really the idea of realization so much. It's more of you yeah. accept, accept the doctrines and then you, yeah. and you are saved. So, yeah. not, not to say that Christians, there might not be elevated Christian saints, but that's not a mm. mainstream part of their process that one will get realization mm. or one's consciousness yeah. will get elevated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that would mean that. Uh, a devotee, say, who is working in cosmology, in a field of cosmology, and the devotee deals with the normal world as is pursued by scientific, cosm by scientific cosmology, and then the devotee studies the Bhagavatam. The, uh, that devotee doesn't yeah. have to necessarily think that, okay, I'm in this profession, therefore, like, I, just engaging in this profession means that I'm selling my soul, or I am, uh, I am, <laughs> yeah. something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, in fact, what they can do is correlate the two things based on the spiritual realization that can give a new concept to cos modern scientific cosmology, yeah. introduce another viewpoint into it. You know, they can contribute to it, <coughs> but having it advanced by taking another viewpoint. One other point is that um, Bhaktivinoda Thakur talks about the Saragrahi and the Baraha uh, Vahi. Yes, <laughs> so, yeah. in, in terms of religion, so he says the Saragrahi takes the essence of the religion, which also means the realization of prema within the religion. That's the essence ultimately. And around that we get traditions, uh, customs, signs, uh, like tilak or dress and so many things, the words you use, the scriptures you accept, your doctrines of your philosophy. So they're all useful in one sense, but they're also you can say external. So if we just concentrate on the externals and we don't get that essence, then we lose everything. So you have to be a sargrahi. If you get attached to the externals, then you become a fanatic or a prejudiced person or a sectarianism, a sectarian, a sectarian person, you know? Uh, and then you, have, uh, you fight with other groups because of that. Uh, your group's different from my group, your doctrine is different from my doctrine, your dress is different, etc. So if we concentrate on these externals, then uh, we end up with, uh, we lose the essence completely and, you know, that's the end of the religion or the faith because the realization is gone. So we have to uh, uh, go for that sar, the essence on all times. Otherwise, we the barvahi bar for carrying loads of, you know, attachments to us, with us. Yes, my. That's since I've heard this Saragrahi and Bhava, Bharavahi repeatedly. Now you put this differentiation. You put 
even the doctrines of the philosophy that could also be the externals you're saying so yeah, yeah well get attached to the doctrine for the doctrine's sake and we just fight over doctrine you know and we don't see a commonality behind it for instance if we were in one religion then we'll say you know uh, allah is god not jehovah <laughs> or uh, allah is god not krishna like this uh, we take a broader view then we say okay yeah, they're, 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 we have different names for God, but the concept is the same. There's a high a supreme person. So that's understanding the essential part of the doctrine, not the external aspect of the doctrine. Hmm. So the so you would say that the literal say expecting that somebody say some spiritual teacher expecting that uh, that the fifth canto be ex accepted literally. And demanding that as yeah. as demanding that as the sign of faith from followers, that would fall in yeah. not exactly in the saragrahi. The the bar of bar of okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you don't accept this, you're excommunicated from our group. <laughs> yes, my gosh. That's you know, this is so I wish that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Just, you have a few more minutes, Maharaj. I'll finish. Maybe five yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so actually, uh, within our tradition, uh, for, regarding the compartmentalization of, say, science and uh, uh, religion to different levels, yeah. there's one side which is our tradition is can be very comfortable with that because we already have different levels of reality. There's gross material, subtle yeah. material, spiritual. Yeah. And yeah. it is said that yeah. these higher levels are inconceivable. So in that sense, yeah. we, are, we can naturally compartmentalize and give space for everyone. But from another perspective, yeah. uh, our tradition also seems to say that scripture is the final authority, not just for spiritual knowledge, but also for material knowledge. Hmm. So now that could lead to problems because then if say there are some areas when the scriptural view and the scientific view do not agree, then, mm. then is it our tradition's position, first of all, that scripture is the final authority on material knowledge also, or is it more that scripture is authority on spiritual knowledge? Well, um, I don't think that's being covered too much in our Gaudiya philosophy and maybe in Karma, I mean, Mamsa, they deal with that. I'm not sure. Um, but I think um, probably even there, uh, they may, if it's a, simply a, a technical material detail, they may give preference to observation in that case. I'm not sure, but they may, they may do that in karma mimamsa. Oh, so it's not uh, like a defining tenet of our epistemology that scripture is the authoritative source of material knowledge also? I thought that's what uh, uh, the Sandarbhas say. Well, in, in the broad sense, obviously, because we define matter, you know, in terms of elements, etc. So we have to accept that. We can't challenge that and say, okay, uh, you're talking about material world, and we, I don't accept ahankara. I don't accept uh, earth, water, air, fire. You know, like this, I accept 108 elements. We, you know, obviously, we do have to accept that aspect of it. Yeah? When it comes to a detail, maybe uh, there's a little problem, like uh, you know, when so and so in which year he you know, uh, went around the earth and conquered the earth or whatever like that. You know, it may be a, a small detail, a historical detail. There may be some, you know, contradiction somewhere. But that again, we can say is uh, not so significant because uh, the history is always repeating itself every day of Brahma and it's slightly different all the time. So that for historical details, even those are adjustable in one sense. Oh. So certain aspects of material observation in the scriptures is it's very flexible because we have you know every day of brahma and so many thousand yuga cycles in one day of brahma etc so the experience could be repeated many times and be slightly different that's amazing you know i wish that you know when i was introduced to krishna consciousness in the first few years i had this understanding because initially i went through a lot of conflict I thought I had to choose between science and scripture, but actually there is a way in which okay. we can preserve our rationality. At the same time, we can preserve yeah. our yeah. Yes, Maharaj. Acha. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, can I just quickly summarize what we discussed, Maharaj? And if you want, you can speak some concluding words. Mm -hmm. So we tried to discuss, yeah. you know, say left left brain, right brain approaches to scripture. And then you started by how this uh, is brain researcher, she had a different way of looking after a stroke. So that's one scientific yeah. way of saying that, you know, the science way of looking at reality is not the only way. Then another layer yeah. of evidences are through all paranormal research, whether it is uh, various kinds of research done in Stanford and other places. And then, so we could say that our Bhagavatam cosmology is also another way of looking at reality. And uh, yeah. within science itself, there are different ways. There is quantum physics, which uh, sees reality very differently from modern, uh, from Newtonian physics. So if within science yeah. itself, there are different ways of looking at reality, then there could be some ways which are outside science also. And scripture offers us yeah. that view. And, and Shukadeva Goswami is himself a yogi. So he's giving a vision yeah. of a universe that is meant to increase appreciation for the Lord. That how the Lord accommodates various living beings at various levels. And from yeah. that purpose, if we see, then that universe is... That, 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 is the, that is the way the fifth canto cosmology is described. And even in our tradition, they, they have been comfortable with different ways of looking at the universe. Say like the scientists yeah. like Aryabhatta, Bhaskaracharya, they had both the Brahmins, so they accepted Jyot, the, the Puranas, but they also accept Jyotish Shastras. And then, so, you yeah. just that, then the question was, how, how is much is this depictable? So it's very difficult to depict mm -hmm. because it's more in terms of visions or images. So some depictions can yeah. be done, but we don't have to literally insist that this is the way it is. And certainly we don't have to yeah. insist that the scientific way is wrong. So we yeah. could say that the Bhagavatam's description can be both symbolic and real or metaphorical and metaphysical yeah. both. And then you talk yeah. about the pendulum. Say one way is that to say that science is wrong, the other is to say scripture is imaginary, but the balanced way would be to the science yeah. has one way of looking, scripture has another way of looking. And then with respect to yeah. it's a it's a tradition, it's, it's it needn't be made into a major faith issue. That if you can't accept this, then you are a heretic. But rather yeah. accept the principles, <laughs> accept the principles, yeah. and then you can uh, you can put aside the other details if you can't accept them. And there are ways in which the details Conflict in the details can be resolved, and you talked about that. Mm -hmm. is that religion without realization becomes fanatical. So the Bharagrahi mm -hmm. and the Saravahi, sorry, Bhar Bharagrahi and yeah. the Bha Bharavahi and the Saragrahi. So to Sar mm -hmm. Saragrahi means to focus on gaining the realization and to encourage people to take up the process by which they can get the realization and not mm -hmm. put in unnecessary obstacles. And even within, so we can have a compartmentalization that science has a jurisdiction for empirical knowledge and scripture yeah. talks about transcendental matters. When scripture gives us a view of the material universe, that is a different model. We accept that model, but that doesn't necessarily mean we have to reject science. And in that way we can yeah, yeah. both go together. Yes, Maharaj. Any concluding yeah. word you want to say, Maharaj? Or anything I left out? Well, one thing is that Ultimately, our aim is to show that if you get a spiritual insight, then you can actually solve your scientific problems in a more uh, absolute way. <laughs> in other words, science is always going to change in the future, depending on our production, Anuman, which keep changing. But if we understand behind that, there is the spiritual essence and spiritual realization, and we give, it, uh, introduce that into science, we can have a more accurate science. So in other words, spirituality can't contribute to science by giving a higher vision to it. So we get more perfect science in the material world by recognizing spirituality. Yes, Manasha. That would be a profound contribution. I think that will also require a lot of dedicated study of both science and scripture to be actually able to do that. But that would yeah, be a yeah, yeah, profound yeah. contribution. Yeah. Yes, Manasha. Thank you very much for your time. It's been illuminating okay. having this discussion with you. Humble obeisances, Maharaj. Hare okay. Krishna. Hare Krishna.